Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you're going to spend an evening in the dark. So that you can fully enjoy this digital detox, we ask you to turn off your phones, computers, and other devices that could disturb the darkness. You just had a day of looking at the future of media, but tonight we're going to have a radio evening. In this dark room, we'll listen to three sound portraits of different cities. They will be stories about what cannot be seen. Alle huizen zijn in dezelfde beige baksteen en hebben dezelfde oprit met dezelfde witte garagepoort. Het gras is netjes en voor de huizen dezelfde brievenbus in hetzelfde beige. Harrison Township is een buitenwijk van Detroit. Ik ben ver van de stad nu. Hier heerst orde. Anything that's outside of Detroit is a suburb. This is Ryder. It's like actually bigger than Detroit itself, it's itself uh, right? Detroit is huge. That's the problem. There's no way to properly control it on the funds that we have. Ryder is a schrijver, zoals zijn naam het zegt. So this is you reading. Yeah, this is one of my readings. Uh, my first poem. Hij schrijft fictie en non-fictie over Detroit. Will be called State of Emergency. Een stad waar hij heel zijn leven heeft gewoond. I'm a lifetime veteran of Detroit City, remotely controlled by Illuminati. You can call them bankers or whatever you want. All I know is gangsters get their cash up front. With that. Hij kan me dus wel iets vertellen over de stad, denk ik. Hij heeft koffie voor me gezet. Met cake. No, that's okay. En hij stelt voor dat we straks aan Lake St. Clair gaan wandelen om over de stad te praten. Ik vraag me af of Writer zijn echte naam is. Hemingway Suite. Writer toont me foto's. I like to take photographs of things in and around the city and I've got a great uh, photo album called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. That's a, that's a lot of the inspiration for the poetry. I write. De tuin van goed en kwaad. Dat lijkt me een plek waar goed en kwaad niet zo goed van elkaar te onderscheiden zijn. And what's the garden of good and evil? It harkens to a time where Detroit. Twintig jaar geleden was het donker in de tuin van goed en kwaad. Midtown, the very popular midtown and downtown, was actually a very corrupt and venal and seedy place called the Cass Corridor. And you can drive down it without seeing pimps, pushers, crack dealers, alcoholics, derelicts, people who fall asleep with a cigarette and set the whole tenement building on fire. I mean, this was just a common occurrence: people who steal the wires out of the street lights. Het centrum van Detroit werd bevolkt door crack dealers en hoeren en mensen die in slaap vielen met een brandende sigaret in hun hand. En het koper werd uit de straatverlichting gestolen. It was an ugly place, but it was our place. Misschien is het daarom nu nog altijd zo donker op straat. In Detroit is bijna geen straatverlichting s'nachts. It was our place, but we didn't take care of it. Maar het wordt beter. It's at the point of uh, midnight. In, in the garden of good and evil, it's the morning coming in the, in the garden of good and the night receding in the garden of evil. If you'd like to go to a movie or you'd Writer like to go to a game, I'd like to treat you and go with really? you. Really? Yeah. Oh, lovely. Okay. Yeah. I think that that he probably would nice Detroit experiences. Okay. Not odd or, oh my God, I, I almost risked my life in Detroit. I want you to have some. <laughs> I think that I'm better as a reporter. You were saying about um, the road. Are you coming back ever? To Detroit? Mm -hmm. I think so. Are you having a nice time now? I, I really do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm surrounded by really nice people. Yeah. I'm talking about at this particular moment. At this particular moment? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's very interesting to talk about, yeah. I don't know. Ik denk dat hij de microfoon vergeten is. Are you still recording? <laughs> Oh, sure, it's not you're a pervert. No. So I'm asking you a personal question. I'm going to put it off. No, no, no. 
You go ahead, knock yourself out. Writer leert me het belang van de tegenwoordige tijd. You don't want to say, I, I might have gone to the store today. That doesn't make a very interesting opening to a poem or a line. You say, I went to the store today and so and so. Dat spreken in de voorwaardelijke wijs, dus over hoe de dingen hadden and kunnen so zijn, dat hij dat niet doet. You, you know? Behalve één man, die mocht dat. In de voorwaardelijke wijs spreken. But I will say there is one writer who could get away with that, and that was T.S. Eliot. In het gedicht The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, bijvoorbeeld. And would it have been worth it all after the cakes and the tea and ices as after some talk of me and you after the cakes and the tea and ices to force the moment to its crisis would it would it have been worth it all to roll the afternoon into a ball if one settling by a shawl should say that is not what I meant at all that is not what I meant at all en zou het dit allemaal waard geweest zijn? Na de thee en het gebak en het ijs? Na wat gepraat over jou en over mij? Om dit moment tot een hoogtepunt te dwingen. En zou het dit allemaal waard geweest zijn om deze namiddag tot een bal te rollen? Als een van ons zou zeggen... Zo heb ik het helemaal niet bedoeld. Zo heb ik het helemaal niet bedoeld. And what he's trying to say in this beautiful poem, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, is that uh, he's getting up in years, his hair is balding, he's still single, he'd like to have a family, he'd like to have a girl. Ondertussen heeft Reiter mijn linkerhand in zijn handen genomen. So he's saying, okay, I'm going to go to this dinner party, and the first hot chick I'm going to see, I'm just going to say, let's get out of here and go for a walk while the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient being etherized upon a table. Dit gedicht gaat over twee mensen die gaan wandelen aan het water, wanneer de avond zich uitstrekt als een patiënt onder narcose. And he's going over all the things that he wants to say, but then he doubts himself and says, what if when she asked me how I was doing, she didn't really mean how was I doing, she didn't really care, it's just something perfunctory. What if I tell her how I'm really doing, and she says, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. Dit gedicht gaat over een man die van alles wil vertellen aan een vrouw, maar met de grote angst dat het haar eigenlijk niet echt wat kan schelen. And so he has to fight this internal conflict throughout the whole poem. Dat het allemaal slechts formele oppervlakkigheid is. En dat het allemaal niet zo bedoeld was. And that pretty much sums it up how we feel in the presence of a a beautiful woman or a daunting task or an, a job we can't manage or the hopes and dreams of other people thrust upon us. We zijn altijd alleen. En we vragen ons altijd af, is het dit allemaal waard? We have lingered in the chambers of the sea with mermaids wreathed in gold and brown to human voices wake us and we drown. Why is this poetry so important to you? We're, we're always alone and we always wonder Should we ask the person not to go to the drive-in, but to come out with us? We always wonder, what is the cost-benefit? We always wonder, should we ask the job for the boss? You know, there's just a, a lot of things in life. We're always torn between nothing and forcing the moment to its crisis. Gedwongen tussen niets en het uiterste. And so it's a universal poem and will always be. Ik probeer het gesprek weer over te nemen en vraag waar Ryder schrijft. Well, Katharina. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the special Visconti pen, the Vitrino pen, the drug pipe paraphernalia, the crack pipe. Where's the crack pipe? I seem to have misplaced my crack pipe. My uh, 
this is my one of my guns and then um one of your guns yeah I, how did that feel to handle a gun i have no idea how it must feel well let's change that right or do it in kleerkast open en so, schuift uh, wat kleren op zij. Een brandkast. Look that way. En dan haalt hij zijn verzameling geweren boven. Oh my god. Like any other tool. It's not really a big deal. Oké. Okay. Always when you shoot a, a shotgun, the first thing you do immediately is rack because it knocks the other shell out. My hands are sweaty. Ik heb yeah. nog nooit een geweer in handen gehad. I've never held a gun before. Just shoot. So I look at in one straight line. Oh, hold on, you're blushing. Let me get a picture of you blushing. I like this. So you're going what, sorry? You're blushing. I'm going to get a picture of you <laughs> You turn like three shades of red. Okay, now pick something. Okay, I'm I'm pointing at the... Anything. the point at, at the, me. No, no, I point, don't point it's at you. It's okay, point at okay. me. Point at me. Okay, over your shoulder. Oh, no, no me. Right in the chest. Point to my chest. There we go. Oh God. Chest, not arm. I don't want to be. I write. I need my arm. Okay, ready? Ik stel me de foto voor die writer nu trekt. Ik kijk recht in de loop van mijn geweer. Okay. Dat ik samen met mijn microfoon go. in mijn zwetende handen houd. Go. So I I pull the trigger. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> Pull the trigger. Do you want to do the interview? Do you want to do the fucking interview? Okay. Pull the trigger. Go on. Martini or screwdriver? What's the difference? Uh, one is orange juice and one is vermouth. Vermouth, please. Writer maakt me een cocktail. So, uh, Die kan ik wel gebruiken, denk ik. So this is um, a screwdriver. This is a machine. Uh, are you going to tell anyone about me? You're not going to tell anyone about you? I got friends or something. Writer vraagt of ik over hem zal vertellen. I don't live until you mention me. Yeah, I think I will mention you, yes. Dat hij niet bestaat tenzij ik over hem vertel. Dat ik dit anders allemaal verzonnen zou kunnen hebben. We rijden naar het strand. Om in de verte naar Detroit te kijken, in de ondergaande zon. Renaissance, right there. The, the, the flats and then the high thing. De stad lijkt zo vet nu. Ja? Ja. Ja? Mhm. They gotta be crazy to be out. No, they have to be white to be out. There's so much more information I want to tell you. So many things that come up. Mm-hmm. Once you start reading it, you have questions to ask me, okay? I will. Writer heeft me zijn boek gegeven. Een roman die zich afspeelt in Detroit. Allemaal echt gebeurd. It's all real. I call it fiction, but those are real people. It just keeps me from being sued. Really? And then I want you to find which one is me. I didn't tell you the best part about that novel. It's a novel about writers trying to make it in Detroit. So it answers all of your questions. That's good. Mm -hmm. So you think of something you want to do, and then I'll think of something. And if mine trumps yours, we do mine. If yours is better than mine, we do yours. Maybe, I don't know. Okay. What, what, do, what do you expect from me? For you to forget that I'm an interviewing. Is this all my work? Hey. Yes. If you started to like me, would you tell me? 
Of course. I swear. If I started to like you. Yeah. Of course. Zo heb ik het helemaal niet bedoeld. You have just heard a piece called Writer by Belgian audio artist Katharina Smets. It is one of the many great foreign language features you can hear thanks to Eleanor McDowell's project Radio Atlas, which is an English language home for subtitled documentaries, dramas, and works of sound arts that have been made in languages you don't necessarily speak. But we will now hear a piece closer to home. I would like to welcome John Beecham to the stage. He is the managing editor of the new audio section at Culture.pl, which produces the flagship podcast Stories from the East and West, as well as other productions in English and Polish. He gained his broadcast experience at Polish Radio, where he filed for the English section of the external service. A news broadcaster initially, John now has his site set on short-form feature documentaries. John, how would you describe your latest feature podcast, Unseen? Is this on? Hello? This is very bizarre. I've never spoken with a radio before or spoken to a radio. I'm usually the voice coming out of here. Um, sorry, that was a very bad anecdote to start off the evening. Um, so Unseen, uh, as, as, uh, Leia's, as Leia said, um, last year uh, Culture.pl started a new series of podcasts called Stories from the East and West. It's a narrative podcast. Um, and after that, there, is, there will be a second series this year. We decided that it would be nice to explore um, other forms, uh, other narrative forms, other forms of audio. So we thought to ourselves, well, wouldn't it be good to do a sound walk? So we started thinking, okay, so if we're going to do a sound walk, where do we do it? How do we do it? Um, and someone came up with a brilliant idea of doing uh, say, uh, and said, um, how about we do a sound walk about places which don't exist anymore? And I'm like, yeah, that's just, that's it, isn't it? Um, because at the same time, you have uh, a place which does exist. It's, we decided that, like, yes, it, it'll be in Warsaw. And uh, Warsaw has a very turbulent history. And there are plenty of places which simply aren't around anymore. So this uh, gave me the idea of thinking, okay, so... If it's going to be in Warsaw, where do we do it? Um, and initially, I came up with three places. Uh, the first is Parade Square, which is around the Palace of Culture. The second is the Saxon Gardens, because uh, there are a few interesting buildings which used to exist there, which obviously aren't there anymore. And I was thinking, OK, then we can go across the river to the Praga district, which is on the eastern side of the Wisła, or the Vistula River. And then there's just so much there. There's just so much to take in. And in the end, I decided that, well, actually, no, it's best to stick to one thing. Um, but then, of course, you have the problem, you know, what, where do you start? So I started listening to so many either audio guides, uh, whether they be from Warsaw or from other cities. Um, and uh, I came across um, a social anthropologist called Magdalena Stopa, who wrote a book called Przed Wojnowi Pałacem, so Before the War and the Palace which uh, is a history of sorts of the 50 hectares which, may, which make up now the uh, parade square around the Palace of Culture. Yet, um, obviously now, what was, they were completely, it was completely cleared in the 1950s to make way for the Palace of Culture. So I decided, okay, that's really good. So I met with Magda and we, thought we, we sat down and said, okay, let's look at 10 places um, based roughly from uh, the book which she had written. But we decided to add a few uh, new ones in there. Um, and um, we thought, okay, 
this this is good. We're going to go for it um, because uh, there's a and in which in that way we also had a really clear link uh, between uh, the first season of Stories from the East and West, which had uh, two episodes on the Palace of Culture, and here we were with a sound walk of places which didn't exist around the Palace of Culture, but not actually including the Palace of Culture itself. So. Then I got a bit philosophical and started reading about psychogeography and ecoacoustics, and I thought to myself, this is great, but I really don't have time to really do this, so how about I just kind of dive into it head first? Um, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, we came up with a list of 10 places. Uh, I won't go through all of them now because I want to keep this short and sweet because I know you just want to listen to the, listen to the episode. Um, and the, but I will quickly uh, talk about the process because um, in doing such a uh, sound walk, I had realized that um, doing that on places which don't exist is actually a bit more of a challenge than I had expected. I mean, if you have an audio guide, you, let's say, record the sound of the place which exists, and then you can have an, either an oral history on it, or you can have some sort of uh, narration. And here, we, I simply didn't have that. So I thought to myself, okay, this is, presents a challenge, but it's a nice challenge, because uh, it's a creative challenge, because I'm going to be giving the sounds of places which don't exist anymore. So what I did was I um, decided to, at the beginning of every episode, there is a guide. First of all, you have to know where to stand, uh, as with every audio guide or sound walk. Um, and this is actually also a bit of a challenge because what was once a street is now the middle of a car park. So you're looking around and like, okay, there's a coach there and there's the entrance to the metro. Uh, and you're thinking, okay, how do you, how do, you do this? Um, so I went out and I recorded uh, the soundscape of the place which uh, exists nowadays. And then after the guide finishes, you are taken into an imaginary soundscape. Obviously, I don't know uh, what the Warsaw of the 1840s sounded like. Um, and as you'll hear, um, I, the, the first episode, which we'll be playing in a moment, is about the Warsaw uh, Vienna station. Uh, and it's a very important um, place in the history of Warsaw because it's the first railway in Polish territories. Um, and because of that railway station, the center of Warsaw is what we see today with all the hotels around uh, the roundabouts and the, the crossroads between Marszakowska Street and Jerusalem Avenue. So, you know, I was even calling up people saying like, did trains have whistles in the 1840s? And you're really kind of beginning to think, you know, um, you have to really think about what was then. but. It's only a sound walk, so you can actually, and it's the, these are imagined soundscapes. So there are a lot of, um, yeah, there was a lot of room for, for creativity. Um, so there are uh, ten episodes um, of the of the sound walk. The first is the Vienna station. The last is actually the uh, Tribune of Honor, which actually is the only place in the whole series of the ten sound walks which actually uh, still exists. However, the political system under which the Honorary Tribune and the Palace of Culture were created does not exist. So there's a kind of nice twist um, at the end. Um, and uh, the sound walk will be uh, available as a downloadable podcast, but I'm also experimenting with the geolocative app. So you can actually walk into an area where the specific addresses and where the specific buildings were, uh, where the sound will automatically turn on and you'll be able to hear this. Um, and again, this is the reason why I decided not to make it into one long walk, but to actually serialize it into uh, 10 distinct episodes of 10 distinct places. Uh, and you can listen to them in any order, so that they are in chronological order, but it really doesn't matter uh, which, uh, which order you listen, and, uh, listen to them. Um, and I think I'll stop there, because I know Leia has some questions. Sorry, the radio has some questions. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing what you guys have to say about about the piece. Um, and it's uh, yeah, it's a very a very exciting moment for me. So thank you. Any questions? 
John, if someone uh, told you that Warsaw is a strange choice of city for an audio tour because it doesn't have necessarily the glamour of Paris or the edge of Berlin, what would you answer? I'd say that actually Warsaw has the edge. Uh, Warsaw is a great city and actually partly because of the fact that it has such a turbulent history and, it, and all these places now are, well, the old town was recreated from scratch. You have places like open, massive open spaces like uh, Parade Square. Um, and which are, you know, you have a, a blanket of cobbles and there's all this history underneath. You have a whole network of streets. There was normal life um, before, before the Second World War. There was just, uh, it was just part of downtown Warsaw. So I think, uh, and, and again, Warsaw is, uh, again, interesting in the way that it is a city which actually doesn't come to mind straight away. So uh, I thought that actually Warsaw would be a good place to start and not another Polish city, for instance, Kraków because everyone's been there, done that, then actually Warsaw needs a bit of recognition. Thank you, John. Ladies and gentlemen, you will now hear Unseen. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. Unseen Sound Walks from culture.pl here you are on a plaza in front of the main entrance to the central underground station. Here in Warsaw, we call it the Patenia. That's a frying pan to you and me. You can also see the Palace of Culture from here. It's pretty hard not to notice, right? The walls of the Patenia are usually covered in graffiti. I wonder what images you're looking at now. The plaza bustles with people during the day. There are those running to and from work or school. As you can see, it's also a popular meeting hub, so there are people greeting each other all the time or sifting crowds for familiar faces. You might also hear some music. Maybe someone's playing an accordion or even a chair. There's plenty to keep your ears busy while you're here. But there's more here than meets the eye. Do you see the doorway to the shopping arcade situated between the two underground entrances? This was once an entrance to the Warsaw Vienna station. It's a warm and sunny day in June 1845. A crowd of Varsovians have gathered at one of the city's new landmarks, the Warsaw Vienna Railway Terminus, to catch a glimpse of the engineering miracle that is the steam powered railway. At a time when the industrial age was transforming much of Europe, at long last the railway had come to Warsaw, then the capital of Congress Poland, a partition under rule by the Russian Empire. The Kurier Warszawski, a local newspaper of the time, describes the historical event with fitting solemnity. The day after the railway's official opening on Saturday the 14th of June 1845, its front page article writes, The invention of the steamship and the later use of steam for the railway will make the years gone by recalled for centuries to come. Yesterday bore witness to the ceremonious opening of the Warsaw Vienna Railway, an event much demanded and anticipated by the entire country, and whose completion in a few years will bring Warsaw closer to the Mediterranean and the rest of the entire European mainland in terms of trade. The good people of Warsaw had been waiting a decade to ride the rails wherever they would take them. Here's what Andrzej Paszka, a railway historian, has to say about the beginnings of the Warsaw Vienna Railway. The idea came about quite quickly in 1835, so ten years after regular rail services began in Britain. However, it took another ten years for railway services to appear in Poland, which was then still part of the Russian Empire. Take a moment to look around you. It's pretty busy, right? You might think that this place was always the centre of Warsaw, but in fact this part of town was little more than a rural outpost. Here's Piotr Hummel, a local historian and guide. If we move back to the end of uh, 18th century, actually the view that you will see around would be just the fields. It was a province uh, just out of the city with a small roads and endless fields. There were, of course, 
certain obstacles during the construction. Uh, the railway couldn't just plow into the center of town by the Castle Square, Krakowskie Przedmieście or Nowy Świat Street. But there was a main street which connected Nowy Świat and that was the Aleja Jerozolimska or Jerusalem Avenue. So it formed a good link with the rest of the city and the old town. It was decided that the terminus of the Warsaw-Vienna line would be situated at the crossroads of Jerusalem Avenue and Marszałkowska Street. Works on the station began on the 18th of July, 1844, according to a design by Enrico Marconi, an Italian architect who moved to Poland in the 1820s. A foundation stone was laid which contained a metal capsule with contemporary newspapers and a copper plaque which informed thanks to whom the railway and station were built, in Polish on one side, in Russian on the other. There was an entrance in the main corpus, in the middle, and on the both sides there were two wings, and on both ends of the wings there was a very characteristic towers resembling a bit the chimneys of the trains and the platforms were on the back of the main building on the open air and because of this building actually next tenements were built around hotels and uh, different institutions started to grow and just uh, housing in the whole Marshall Coast Street has started to rise and actually became one of the most crowded streets in the city center from the mid 19th century if you're looking at the entrances to the metro station it was roughly in this place where you would be looking at the Vienna station clock tower if you sweep your eyes to the left towards the Palace of Culture, there you would see the East Wing and Corpus with the main entrances to the Vienna Station. Further on, you have the West Wing and the final Telegraph Tower, which was where the trees are over there to the left. As you can imagine, it was a truly majestic building which became a landmark in the city for years to come. But back to our story and fast forward a year to the opening of the station and the railway on that summer's day in 1845. When the railway opened, there were ten locomotives, all imported from John Cockerill's factory in Belgium. The inaugural train left the station at around half past three, carrying 200 passengers including Ivan Paskevich, the Tsarist Viceroy, with a full military orchestra taking up the first carriage behind the loco. The whole crowd arrived in Grodzisk, where Count Makronowski greeted them at his manor park in Jordanowice. The next day, on the 15th of June, regular railway services were introduced on the first stretch of line between Warsaw and Grodzisk, on a predefined timetable. And that's when the railway started for good. The arrival of the railway greatly influenced the development of Warsaw, as you can see around you now. The station soon became too small to handle the amount of passenger traffic, although at the turn of the century, a second building, which was turned into an arrivals hall, was built behind the station on the other side of the tracks, where the car park is now by the Palace of Culture. But what about the name of the railway? Did it really go all the way to Vienna? Well, the short answer is no, it didn't. It was merely a marketing trick to spark the imagination. It wouldn't be another three years until it was possible to take a train directly to the Austrian capital. The station remained in situ until the 1930s, when one of the wings was dismantled to make way for a new tunnel, which would be part of a new railway line connecting both sides of Warsaw. The rest of the building was destroyed in the opening weeks of the Second World War and later demolished. After the war, there was a plaque which commemorated the station, but that too was dismantled when the metro was built in the 1990s. All that remains are the surrounding buildings, which bear testament to the importance of the arrival of the Warsaw-Vienna Railway all those years ago.
have just heard Unseen by John Beecham. Let's give him a warm round of applause. We will now hear radio producer and presenter Kathy Fitzgerald. She made her first documentary, The Magic Carpet Flight Manual, in 2010, and she has since won Third Coast Festival, Wickers World Foundation, Audio Production, and Pre Merilich Awards. She's the founder and caretaker of Strange and Charmed, a school for audio storytellers. In her own words, she's an awkward romantic always seeking tiny moments of perfect communing, communion with other critters. Kathy, could you describe the piece we will hear tonight? Um, yeah, and I will keep it short and sweet and let the piece talk for itself. Um, so it's a piece I made for the BBC World Service and um, it's about the experience of immigrant taxi drivers in New York. So essentially, what does it take to drive the famous yellow cab? Um, we're going to taxi school. Kathy, New York taxis instantly evoke yellow cars, but not necessarily philosophical conversations. What made you want to capture the voices of New York cab drivers? Um, I think it's sort of twofold. One, I, um, I just think it's a perfect place to tell stories. If you've ever been in a car, you know, you're just, you're riding along and you, it's just a perfect place to sit and talk to someone. Um, so it's partly that, and um, it's partly just that they actually have a really, really hard time. They are treated really quite poorly uh, by those of us who get into cabs. And um, yeah, I suppose I just sort of felt a tremendous human sympathy for that and wanted to tell that story. Thank you, Kathy. We will now listen to the Yellow Cab Blues. It feels so good to be back in New York. Why don't we grab a cab and go out for dinner on the Upper East Side? I feel like having something spicy. Why don't we try Indian food? Great! Maybe we can go watch a comedy show after dinner. Great! Children, you have three minutes to put the answers on the answer sheet. Let's go. Five answers here, A, B, C, D. Come on, start writing answer, answer sheet now, my friend. Answer sheet. We're at a school in Little India. Nope, not the subcontinent. A neighborhood in New York. The L train rumbles overhead. Street stalls sell prayer mats and Qurans. And a nearby shop has discount dresses for Diwali and Eid. But we're down below ground in a windowless basement. Attendance sheet, my friend. Fifty or more men sit in school chairs. They come from all around the world to learn how to be New York taxi drivers, entitled to drive the famous yellow cab. Egypt, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Guinea, Nepal, Tibet, Pakistan. Make sure you take with you three pencils like this. Take three pencils like this, why? One breaks, second is ready. Second breaks, third is ready. If the third pencil breaks, God is giving you a signal. God is saying, I want you to fail the exam. God is breaking your pencil first. This is their tutor, AJ. He's been teaching taxi for more than two decades and rules the room like a stand-up comic, dishing out put-downs and praise. He speaks nearly as many languages as his students. And if your cell phone rings during class, He'll sting you with a five dollar fine. I had one student last month, two months, he take like 20, 25 pencils. He opened the box, all the pencils fell on the floor. He teaches his class just enough to pass the TLC exam. That's the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Some basic English comprehension, New York City geography, plus cultural differences between their old and new homes. So yep, yeah, the TLC tape recorder will say the address two times. How many times? Two times. Okay. So it's a good idea, on the day of the exam, you take a shower and clean your ear. Because I know a lot of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh people, we don't take shower every day, my friend. So it's a good idea, take a shower. Remember, America, we have 24 hours hot water. 
We are not in Bangladesh, right, or India, uh -huh. right, Kamlapur station, somebody sitting on the street uh -huh. who will clean the ear with a screwdriver, <laughs> with a pechkas, with a khurpi. Yeah, right? right? Full service salon yeah. under the tree. Yeah, right. Everything under yeah, the tree. Yeah. The Taxi Workers Alliance says around 95% of New York cabbies are immigrants, come to the US from over 120 different countries. AJ describes his school as a mini United Nations and arranges his students in rows by nationality so that they can help each other out. The atmosphere is studious. It costs $600 just to be in the class. So there's a lot riding on the exam. A lot of people you'll meet here, when I, you know, my dad drives a cab in New York City, I'm going to go drive a cab too. Because their way of putting it is it's a halal way of making a living. If you own a grocery store, you're selling cigarettes, you're selling alcohol, you're selling lottery tickets. So you're doing a lot of stuff, you're selling pork items. So it's a lot of stuff against religion. I would, I would probably say over 80% of the population driving cabs are Muslims in, the, in New York City. So a lot of them want to make a good living but at the same time, follow the religion. Because you drive in a cab, you want to pray five times, you can pray five times. You want to pray 10 times, you can pray 10 times. You're your boss. That's the aspiration, work with dignity and honor, a halal way to make a living. But is that really what the new taxi drivers, or hacks as they're known, are going to find on the other side of the exam? I take the E train downtown to a hole in the wall restaurant called the Lahore. Opposite a big petrol station, it's a favourite with taxi drivers during their breaks. They come to fill up on petrol and curry. And chamber or yeah. worth and something you else? You're gonna park or what are you doing? I parked the cab for the first time. I got myself lost. I, I read something square. Sharon is one of very few female cabbies in New York. She came here from Egypt as a little girl. She wears a hijab and is lugging two bulging bags of shopping. And right now, she's upset. My last customer was a Chinese guy. He wanted to go to Chinatown, and he showed me actually a shortcut to Chinatown, which I was so pleased. And as I'm driving, he's like, ma'am, there's a supermarket on the left. It's very cheap, very nice. I'm like, you know what? Looks like I'm going to take my lunch, so I'm not going to eat. I'm going to go for that one hour shop. I parked my cab far, and then yeah. I walked to it. And uh, the sad part is, I lost my cap. <laughs> New York City, whoa. <laughs> it's one of the most common complaints among passengers, the cabbie who doesn't know where they're going. But the NYC test doesn't require a particularly intimate knowledge of the street, and many immigrant drivers are doing their best in an unfamiliar city. First copy, then I'm going to explain. Copy, let's go. AJ teaches geography by rote. Now, Triborough Bridge has a new name, Jaffer. What is the new name for Triborough Bridge, Jaffer? Robert F. Kennedy. Robert F. Kennedy Bridge. John F. Kennedy brother, Robert F. Kennedy. One is an airport, the other one is a bridge. Robert F. Kennedy Bridge. Oh, on the final exam, Mr. Orkan, the TLC give you this drawing on the exam? No. no. This drawing will be... Inside the head. Inside the head. As they say in Bangladesh, that means there's drawing going inside the head. So people go, hey, how am I going to do this? You practice this one time, two times, three times, four times, ten times. You know what I'm saying? Like last year I had one Bangladesh guy. He goes, AJ brother, before I came to a class, I see Indian movie actresses dancing with me in my sleep. He goes, now, he goes, I go to sleep, I hear Brooklyn Bridge, Manhattan Bridge. He goes, I can't sleep anymore. That's the way it should be. When you go to sleep at night, you're hearing my voice. That's the way it should be. Back on the streets with Sharon looking for her cab. I think about phoning AJ, but decided it would be too embarrassing. So uh, it's you know where McDonald is downtown? You know where is uh, Dunkin' Donut is? Yeah, it was Dunkin a main here, thing. Here. It was a main road. The China road, the China road is so busy road. Yeah. yeah, you go to this Grand Street and mm. this Christmas Street nearby Chinatown. It's not Grand too far Street. From here. Yeah, Grand, right. Okay, Grand Street. Okay, so how far is it from here, Grand? Um, Grand Street. I think we're going the wrong way. I'm just doing the cab thing almost a year. I came straight from Housewife. I needed to do something fast, something quick, and that's it. And that's what I'm doing. How does it compare with being a housewife? 
Oh, big difference. <laughs> I get a lot of uh, compliments from uh, most of the passengers, uh, especially women. They're like, you got some guts to drive in New York City. Exactly. So it's all, it's all about what, how much you know. And it's like a, a baby trying yeah. to walk. You know, you're a baby cab driver. I'm a baby cab driver for right now. <laughs> certain days I do beautiful, certain days nothing. A day like today is really definitely crazy for me. <laughs> Every hour we spend traipsing around New York in search of the lost cab, loses Sharon money. It's not just a matter of the meter, the lost fares. Sharon, like most New York hacks, starts every day in debt. Few drivers own their own cabs. So they have to lease them by the shift, that's $120 maybe, and fill them up with gas. When Sharon drives out of the lot in the morning, she's already $150 down. And on a bad day, it can take eight or nine hours driving to make that up. Driving a New York taxi is no way to get rich. When you were in Bangladesh, people said, go to America, a lot of money. In the river, they have no water, they have milk and honey. <laughs> right? They say in your dollars, you shake the tree and the dollar is going to fall on the street, right? Nobody told you you have to get up at 2-3 o'clock in the morning to go to work. That's the way it is, brother. America life is tough, my friend. Afternoon New York slides past rainy taxi windows. Concrete office blocks massive on either side. And us at their feet, a tiny, grimy yellow cab crawling along the canyon floor. No baggage, no backstory. Just the length of the ride and that dream sensation as the city slips by. My driver, a Sikh, tells me he listens to this guru music for six hours a day to keep cool when he's in the car. Once upon a time, waves of Italian and Irish immigrants drove yellow taxis, made money and moved on to new lives. But today's drivers tend to get stuck in taxi limbo. This is one of the few professions in the world where you can work a 12 hour shift and wind up with less money than you started with. Drivers are 30 times more likely to be killed on the job than the average worker and 80 times more likely to be robbed. And this is all before we get to what really grinds them down. Us, the guys in the back. We get into cabs in every kind of mood and take it out on the driver. How do they put up with us? Okay, what I would like us to do is to open up your books to the passenger driver relations section, which is on page 20. We're back at taxi school, this time at La Guardia Community College. It's a more official affair than AJ's Jackson Heights joint. Everything's taught in more depth, including the knack of getting along with a bad-tempered stranger in a small space. Teacher Andrew Volo knows all about that. He drove a cab for 30 years. So if I were the customer and you were the driver and you would say to me what? Good morning, sir. How, how are you doing? I'm doing miserable. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to drive so good, you, you're going to be fine. Uh, that's the idea. That's the idea. You want to turn around. Don't worry. It'll get better. <laughs> Very important to make eye contact. And in some cultures, People don't make eye contact when they talk. But in New York, it's different. Read the customer. Are they by themselves? And if they get in and they're on the phone right away, there's nothing. they're gone. They're finished. They're over. But they open up a newspaper. They, and they're jumping up and down. You know that they're stressed out because they're late. late. I feel people are always grouchy and angry. They're like always frustrated and going like, they don't have two-second tolerance, even in subway. Try to get in, people push through like, come on, two seconds. Even a pregnant lady, they want to spare. We have 17 things to do before breakfast. Yeah. People get less and less tolerant out there. There's two types of material. Teflon, everything slips off, and Velcro. So you have to be Teflon. 
you have to just let it slide off. It doesn't matter. It's not about you, it's about them. And you don't want one person to sink you for the day. And I would tell you, anytime you act emotional, you're in trouble. This is the secret to taxi cab zen, the inner calm or spirit of whatever that experienced hacks preserve in the face of their passengers worst. Tanvir Mohammed, an intense, good-looking driver in his 30s, has developed his own brand to deal with the craziness of New York nights. He was with his girl, he wanted to show off like he's a big rich guy. I made her turn and I got blocked off by a sanitation truck and he cursed me out in front of his girl and I didn't say anything, I ate it up. He's like, are, are you effing stupid? Didn't you see the truck? I took a deep breath. I was like, you know, this guy is drunk. He wants to show off in front of his girl. I'm going to be the smart one here. I'm going to be like, sir, I'll stop the meter for you. And in the end, when I got there, he actually tipped me very well because he knew I, I was polite. But you get into a confrontation of the littlest things, you know? Taxi, taxi. At least once a week, somebody gets sexual in the back. And, and you know, my father has been working over 20 years. He's very morally correct. He doesn't do drugs, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. And if he saw something like that, he would not be able to take it. He'll be like, please stop, I'm gonna kick you out. Me, I don't mind. I, I, I don't really mind. You could call me a money hungry, I'm out there to make money, it's a hustle. I take a deep breath and I'm like, as long as I get a good tip, that's what I care about. I'm not gonna say all oh, females look at you like, oh, you're a hot commodity because they're coming out of clubs where there's millionaires and celebrities. I'm sure a lot of these girls living on Park Avenue look at you as their doorman, so they're not really attracted to you. But one time, I did get hit on by some really hot girl. I ended up going to bed with her that night, and she was very hot. She was like a 10. And so this job will get you late once in a while, too. <laughs> it does. It does. But she was just looking for a one night. She just used me. I called her again. She never... Whatever. But I'm just saying, you got to let go of your morals, your ethics. It just seems like you're living more than the rest of us. You see more? But that does not mean that you're part of it. In the good book of Taxi, don't take it personally is the golden rule. But that doesn't mean that they, we, can't make the most of our brief encounter. The clunk of the door encloses us together in a comfy, semi-soundproofed world. We couldn't have designed a better place to tell stories if we tried. Um. 73rd Street, 3351 73rd Street. Let me show me that. Right, Where is that? There. Oh, 30, oh, okay. 3351 73rd Street, got it. I'm traveling home with Mansour Halad. Pakistani born, he's been driving taxis in New York since the late 90s and is one of the city's most popular cabbies. The back shelf of his taxi is full of sweets. Eat them all before you arrive at your destination and the trip is free. He's got quite a following among students from NYU and Columbia. They email me, they challenge me, hey candy cab, we're gonna finish your candies. I said, sure, you? no problem. So they give me the dress, I pick them up, they're mentally, physically ready <laughs> to finish all these candies. And then I drive very slowly and I say, guys, don't you want worry. them to win. Yeah, yeah, I want, I want to them. I said, guys, no problem. I want, I'm watching you guys, relax. I'm not gonna drive fast. Take your time, just keep eating. And I love these kids, oh my God. Sometimes like I'm waiting for Thursday, Friday and Saturday night. I'm just every day I'm waiting, oh, Thursday night is coming, Friday night is coming. Since I start calling less uh, guys, let's, let's do boom, boom. So let's do boom, 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 boom. Like what does that mean? Boom, boom, like a big boom, boom music. And <laughs> Do then, they start dancing in the back I, of the camp? Oh, I have a lot of, a lot of dancing and then they don't want to get out. I just look at the mirror. If these guys are enjoying, they are dancing, I say, okay, man great trip is going on right now. Mansour keeps in touch with his passengers on Facebook and Twitter and jokes about needing an assistant to keep up with all his messages. He tells me the music he's playing was a gift from a group of Lebanese ladies who had a candy cab ride on their bucket list. Of course it's easy to dismiss all this as a gimmick but not once you know the story behind all the smiles and free sweets. This all thing started with my little boy. Yeah. I mean, my boy was a sick for two years in, uh, in a hospital in Bronx. So whenever I go visit my son and my wife, I buy a lot of coffees, donuts for the doctors and for the nurses. And when I give to them, they smile, they, oh, thank you so much. You, you save our life. We were so busy. I mean, and I want to do, I wanted to continue. So I was, after, after his death, after two weeks, it just come to my mind, I say, how about I just put like a little sweets on the back of the, my cab, 
and let's see how do it will work. Mm -hmm. And I saw people smiling, people, oh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, you, is free? I said, yes, of course it's free. So they enjoy. And then slowly, slowly, I just keep upgrading my car and <laughs> filling up. And then I bought a and big membership lights. in a Costco. Yeah. So, I mean, disco lights, some keep upgrading, keep upgrading. Isn't it hard to be around people being so happy when you're grieving? Actually, you know, looking at the people, it's not mean I'm not a sad, I do, I miss my boy, my wife miss my, I mean, whenever I reach home, my house is empty. So because uh, whenever I enter in a room, as soon as he see me and uh, his smile was very beautiful. Was it, what was his smile his like? His smile is so, is so pretty and all the time, doctor, nurses, oh, do you know that your son smile on me? I said, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> I said, thank you. I said, and. Um, he was a beautiful boy and a very decent boy and uh, just he'd been through a lot, he'd been through a lot. But people are very nice, <clears throat> a lot of people want to give me a donation. Mm. I said, guys, thank you, I don't, I don't need your donation. You need their smiles. I said, that's it. I said, you guys smiles, you guys laugh, you guys <laughs> scream, these three things work in my car, that's it. <laughs> Smiles, laugh and scream. That's my lifestyle. That's it. You guys just, you know, you guys screaming, looking at the candies, lights, music, enjoy, just that's it. It's enough for me. That's enough. Mansour meets 20 to 30 people every shift. Often his passengers don't want to leave. New York City is so huge, millions of people, but very lonely. Mm. Very lonely city. What makes you think that? I drive them. I drive a lot of lonely, lonely people and very good people, very good people. Over here, they are just, uh, time is uh, making you hyper because a lot of things you have to do. There's some people like an always in a hurry. I say, guys, you know, my car doesn't go that much fast. <laughs> I can drop you, you can I just drop you over here, you can take another cab. So people, what I learned, people re calm down. Mm. People say, no, 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 no problem, we're gonna continue with you. I say, okay. Mm. You know, when I start chit-chatting with them, when I Google their uh, heart, I find our man. I say, man, you are <laughs> calm, you're, you're a cool person, just calm down. <laughs> when you Google their heart, is yeah, that what you I, do? <laughs> yeah, that's, I say, man, I just find out what's the problem. I, I understand, so I chit-chat with these, um, people and sometimes like I'll uh, be si sitting a long time in traffic and we don't realize like uh, you know <laughs> yeah. we're sitting a long time, time in traffic goes. the time just goes yeah. because we chit chatting so when I sh then show them candies and they start slowly slowly when I sometimes I make little jokes and uh, asking and they just once they smile then I just grab them I say okay now I grab the person <laughs> I mean now he's now I've got him. <laughs> then, now, yeah, now I got him or her so it's making me feel good it's nearly the end of our ride, but we can't leave Sharon wandering the New York streets. We're downtown, still searching for her missing cab. Anything look familiar? N nothing yet, nothing okay. yet. We're not going to give up. <laughs> <laughs> we will not be defeated or down her. Oh my God. It doesn't look like I'm going to be able to make the rent for the car today. That's the way I've been wasting a lot of times. Okay, that's the something square, right? That's it. That is it. That's your cab. That, yeah, so it's, what is it? Is it Essex? Is, what, which Wait, one? Wait, hold on. Is that, is that the one? Hold on. Okay, see what happens? I park it here, and then I walk this way. But it wasn't really Broadway. It was East Broadway. Now I know better. So this and is it? And thank you. This is it. This we is found it. the this cab. <laughs> we did it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Taxi! <laughs> that's the finish. Oh, that's the finish. That's, that's, that's the finish. That's how you do it. You got it. Dear listeners, this is the end of our radio evening. Let's give one last round of applause to Kathy and John.